our uh, second reading, we're going to read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 uh, through 21. Hear the Christmas story. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. He went to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Merry Christmas. My name's Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at Faith Church. And I want to welcome you this morning, not this morning, this evening. I did it, Chris, if you're in here. Um, really glad that you're here. We've got people joining online, so I want to welcome you. Uh, this is the live stream service. Also, we've got people that are in an overflow room that are tuning in. So wherever you are this evening, I want to welcome you, but particularly if you're visiting with us. We're really glad that you're here um, yeah, spending this uh, Christmas Eve service with us. We're going to look at one verse, verse 11. It's in your bulletin, um, but let me pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us uh, before we look at verse 11. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, um, praying before a homily or preaching often can feel like something that we just do. It's the next thing. But that's not the case. We desperately need you tonight to show up in power. There are those here this evening or those tuning in that are sad and they need comfort. There are some that are skeptical of Christianity, and they need faith. Others perhaps are beaten down and discouraged and in need of hope. Some are frazzled and stressed in need of peace. Others are weary and exhausted and need strength. And I pray that wherever we find ourselves this evening, that you would give us exactly what we need. 
Holy Spirit, come and make this familiar story fresh. Help us to see with new eyes the wonder and the amazement and the beauty of the Christmas story. We desperately need it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 1868, Bret Hart wrote a short story called The Luck of Roaring Camp. Perhaps you've read it. Roaring Camp was the meanest and the baddest and the most awful mining town, the toughest mining town in all of the West. More murders, more um, stealing and everything that you can think of uh, was going on in this mining town. It was a terrible place that was inhabited entirely by men except for one woman whose name was Cherokee Sal. And she actually died while giving birth to a baby, leaving this baby to be raised by all of these men. And these men took the baby and they put her in a box and put some rags around her and They looked and they thought, this doesn't look right. And so they sent one of their own 80 miles to find a rosewood cradle. And the man brought back the rosewood cradle and he put, took the baby out of the box and put the rags in the rosewood cradle and then placed the baby in the rosewood cradle. And then he thought something, they, this still doesn't look right. So they sent another man to Sacramento to get a beautiful, uh, lots of beautiful silk, white, lacy blankets. They brought the blankets back and the man put the lacy blankets in the rosewood cradle and they placed the baby in the rosewood cradle and then they noticed that the floors were filthy. And a baby doesn't need to be around filthy floors. And so these hardened, tough men got down on their hands and knees and scrubbed the floors until they were spotless. Well, then the dirt that they kicked up made the walls dirty and the ceilings dirty. And so they cleaned the walls and they cleaned the ceilings and they noticed the windows were dirty and the windows needed to be cleaned. So they cleaned those and they noticed that the windows needed curtains. And so they provided curtains. And now things were finally starting to look exactly the way they were supposed to look. But of course, they had to give up their fighting and their brawling. Uh, brawling because babies like to sleep a lot. And they cannot sleep during lots of arguing and fighting. And so the whole temperature of Roaring Camp seemed to go down. They took the baby actually to the entrance of the mine so that when they came out of the mine, that was the first thing that they saw. This baby girl in this rosewood cradle, uh, they saw her and they noticed that it was dirty. And so they planted flowers in a garden. They brought up these stones and gems from the mine that they would place in the cradle and Then they put their hand next to her hand and noticed that they were filthy. And so they went to the general store and got all the soap they could get and the shampoo they could get and the cologne that they could get in order to clean themselves up. You see the point? This baby changed everything. And tonight, we gather here not to celebrate a fable, We gather to celebrate a fact that 2,000 years ago, a baby named Jesus was born in a stable and he did truly change everything about our hearts and our lives and the world. And like the baby at Roaring Camp, Jesus enters our lives and he slips into into every nook and cranny and crevice of our lives and our life and our world and our heart. And one day he will come and renew all things. And that truth is seen very clearly in verse 11, where we find the greatest birth announcement. Think Think about how big birth announcements are right now. You know, golf balls explode and Baseballs explode and all these things to announce the birth of a child. This is the greatest by far birth announcement in the history of the world. Tonight, I want to simply show you Jesus 
and show you that in Jesus is coming at Christmas, he brought good news into the world that changes everything. Two things briefly, why Jesus changes everything and then who Jesus is for. So number one, why Jesus changes everything. And we see it in verse 11. If you have your bulletin, look at verse 11. You see three titles placed on Jesus that tell us why Jesus truly changes everything in our hearts, lives, and world. The first title you see there is Savior. Christmas is the announcement of Jesus coming into the world to tell us that we cannot save ourselves And so God had to take on flesh and come into the world to do what we could never do for ourselves, and that is save us. What does Jesus save us from? You heard the kids mention it, from our sins. Romans chapter 3 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The scriptures say that our sin, because of our sin, we are at war with God and we need peace. And Jesus, the Savior, became poor and was born into a stable so that 30 years later he might hang from a cross. God entered into the world as a baby not to bring judgment, but to bear judgment. And that's what happened on the cross. He bore the judgment of God and the wrath of God for our sin. And when he did that, he ended the hostility between us and God. That's why we're here. That's what we're celebrating here tonight. Think about it. We've been singing about all of these titles and we uh, sang about it. Hark the herald angels sing. Peace on earth, mercy mild, God and centered, reconciled. And that peace and reconciliation is available to you tonight through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And the Bible says that this peace is the most fundamental and most important peace in our lives. And it's this peace, peace with God, that leads to, leads to peace in every other aspect in our lives. Peace with God makes its way and makes and brings peace with ourselves. It brings peace and leads to peace with other people. And it leads to peace with creation. Verse 11, we see another title, Christ. The word Christ means anointed one. Look at verse 4. Jesus is the king. He's the anointed one that has come in the line of David. In all of the Old Testament prophets, and during Advent, we looked at Isaiah, and we all the Old Testament and the prophets anticipated a king who would one day come in the line of David. He's here. That king is Jesus, who was born on Christmas night 2,000 years ago. He's the true king. He's the greater David. That would be everything that King David should have been but was not. And you see, he's the true king, Jesus, that rules the world, and he's the king that's always at work in the world, working everything out for our good and for his glory. And that changes everything, doesn't it? He's the true king that is always at work, working everything out for our good and for his glory. That truth changes everything, especially in a world and in a year like 2020. If we could sum up this year in one word, we could use the word disruptive. Has it been disruptive? Everything in our lives have been, has been disrupted this year. Likewise, if we could sum up the Christmas story in one word, we could use the word disruptive. Think about the Christmas story. Mary, pregnant as a teenager by the Holy Spirit. You think that was disruptive? (laughs) You think that was disruptive to her relationship with Joseph, her family, the people in her community, 
Comes time to have the baby. There's no room in the end. And so they get put in a barn. They get social distanced in a barn. And then when Jesus is born, there's not a box. Think about the story of Roaring Camp. And there's not a rosewood cradle. They have to put Jesus. You think this is disruptive? They have to put Jesus in a feeding trough where animals would eat. Teenagers completely isolated from their families on this Christmas night. No one is present with them concerning their family. And if that weren't enough, shortly after that, they have to run for their lives because Herod is trying to kill their baby. Now listen, we clean the Christmas story up. But it was disruptive. Can you imagine that night if that were you? I mean, you want to talk about feeling afraid and uncertain and out of control and stressed and anxious and lonely and all of the things that we've experienced this year. They had plans on the way that they thought this night should go, and I can assure you this was not it. But here's what you got to understand. Christmas night went exactly according to God's plan. Through their confusion, which they had, through their lack of understanding and the chaos of that night and the disruption of that night, it was through the disruption that God was at work. And he was orchestrating the biggest rescue mission in the history of the world. God sending a baby into the world to save his people from their sins. In February of this year, we had plans, didn't we? We had big plans. We had all the things that we were going to accomplish this year. We had people we were going to see and things we were going to do and family trips that we were going to go on. And I can assure you that what was not in our plan for 2020 was a global pandemic. But it was in God's plan. And the same God, the same king who ruled and watched over the original Christmas story on that first Christmas night 2,000 years ago, is still on his throne. And he's still ruling and reigning over us this Christmas night in 2020. Different disruption, same king. And I say all of those things because we only like to think God's at work when things are going according to our plan. God's always at work in the good things and in the bad things, and we can trust him with, this, with the disruption of our lives. Last title we see in verse 11 is Jesus is Lord. Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh. This is when Jesus is Lord is a title that it's a very clear assertion and title of deity. Jesus is God in the flesh, God with skin. Jesus made that claim, and those closest to him also believe that that is true. And that fact changes everything, doesn't it? Think about this is what we celebrate at Christmas, God taking on flesh and coming into the world in the person of Jesus. And Jesus, come, God coming down to us changes everything, doesn't it? Because it means that God's acquainted with our weakness. God knows what it's like to be human and to suffer and to struggle, and he's been through all the things that we've been through, yet he is without sin. And so what that means is that he can sympathize with us in our weakness, so he has the present to comfort you in your suffering and pain because he's been there. And so think about this. Think about when you're suffering or in pain or struggling, and someone you love just comes and sits with you, maybe cries with you, they don't even really say anything. They are just present with you in your pain. What does that do to you? Well, it heals you. You feel better 
as a result of someone being present with you. It comforts you. Think about Christmas. How much more healing and comforting is it to know that God is present with you in your pain? Did you know that more people this year than ever before, particularly the vulnerable population, will be spending Christmas alone more than ever before because of this pandemic. And there's lots of sadness. And there's lots of people wondering, does God still care? Is God still with me? Christmas. Christmas is the assurance of God's presence and care. Christmas means that God has not left you, that he loves you, and that he is present with you through his spirit. And my prayer for all of us this Christmas is that his presence would be more real and more comforting than ever before this year. Lastly, and briefly, who is king, who is this Jesus who is King, Christ, and Lord. Who is he for? And we see who he's for in the recipient of the birth announcement. Look at verse 11 again. Unto you a child is given. Who is the you? Well, if you look at the context of the Christmas story, it's the shepherds. We don't realize how scandalous this was. Uh, Mary and Joseph were peasants. They had a very low social status. The shepherds were even lower. They were below them. With the exception of the lepers, the shepherds were considered the lowest class of men in all of Israel. Because of their jobs, uh, they could not go into the temple because they were considered unclean and the religious elite would refuse to let them go in. They were so low that they couldn't give valid testimony in the courts. So you with me? The lowest of the low in that society. And God says to the angel, them, go to them first and tell them that I am bringing good news that a Savior, Christ the Lord, is born. Pastor Duke Kwan pointed out and made this observation. We've got Christmas all backwards. Contrary to our typical ways of celebrating the holiday, Christmas was never meant to be the exclusive possession of the merry with smiles or the exclusive possession of the holiday party insider with their social networks or the religious elite or the sufficiently resourced, or the perfect, nostalgic, iconic family with matching sweaters and pajamas. Now, like we see in the delivery of the birth announcement, according to the original Christmas story, Christmas grace is for the social outcasts like the shepherds. It's for the religious inquirer, the ethnic outsider like the magi, Christmas grace is for the heartbroken and confused like Joseph. It's for the poor and the powerless like Mary. The sad and the unfulfilled like Simeon. And the unmarried and childless and widowed like Anna. You see this baby named Jesus who changes everything comes for the little and the least, and the lowly. He comes for those who are lamenting and lacking and longing. This story of this child, the God-man named Jesus, who came and changes everything, reveals that you cannot be too broken. You cannot be too lowly or too weak to be changed by Jesus. But you can be too proud. You can't be too big. As you see, God says in the scriptures, 
that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So I don't know where you find yourself tonight. Maybe you don't know Jesus and you need to place your faith in him for the very first time. Or maybe you're here and you've been to services like this for as long as you can remember. The call is the same. Wherever you are, will you humble yourself and come to Jesus, this Jesus, Savior and Christ and Lord. Come to this Jesus who changes everything. You see, the angel says to all of us tonight, behold, look at the baby lying in a manger. To you, a Savior has been born, and he is the Savior that you need. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time of year. Would you help us to ponder the Christmas story more than we ever have? Help us to ponder what we've heard this evening. And wherever we find ourselves, whether we're full of faith or doubting, would you make the Christmas story more real to our hearts? Increase our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.